It can be argued that water is Ohio's greatest natural resource. Nearly two-thirds of Ohio's border consists of water. Each day, Ohioans consume more than 11 billion gallons of water for personal and business use. The economic impact of the state's water is estimated to be in the tens of billions. Cargo shipping, Ohio ports ranked number eight in the nation. Fishing, three billion in economic impact. Boating, three and a half billion in economic impact. Tourism, 40 billion in visitor spending, plus 415,000 jobs, 892 million in taxes. Perhaps the vast expanse of Ohio's connection to water can best be understood through these impressive statistics. Ohio contains 60,000 miles of rivers and streams, 312 miles of Lake Erie coastline, 425 miles of Ohio River shoreline, 942,000 acres of wetlands, 125,000 plus more lakes, ponds, reservoirs, and 99% of Ohio residents live within an hour's drive of a waterway. What are the biggest threats to Ohio's healthy water? While many factors can threaten a healthy water source, the prevailing factor receiving the most attention in Ohio is pollutants, particularly phosphorus. When considering pollutants that can threaten Ohio's water, there are generally two categories. Pollution from point sources like pipes from factories, ships, ditches, or water sewage treatment plants, and pollution from non-point sources like runoff from fields, urban runoff from streets and lawns, or sediment from construction sites. It is believed that most pollution happens during heavy rainstorms, when fertilizer and other phosphorus sources are quickly washed into rivers, streams, and lakes. Phosphorus is the main ingredient in runoff that causes a problem for our water. Considered a nutrient in many fertilizers, phosphorus can be easily absorbed by many plant species and lead to rapid growth. The amounts of dissolved phosphorus entering our water resources have doubled in the last 25 years. My name is Paul Herring Shaw and I farm in uh, southern Wood County, southwest Wood County. And so there was that big push in the um, 80s and early 90s uh, to adapt no-till. And a lot of us have done it because they now have developed equipment can handle it. I didn't have to work this field in the fall, did not have to work it again in the spring before we planted it. And so it has been something that's been widely adapted. But what has been interesting is, is that the quality of the water in Lake Erie about 20, 25 years ago was pretty good. And then it started going back the other direction. And what has been puzzling to us in agriculture is, is that actually it is well documented that our use of phosphorus fertilizer has been going down in that same time frame. So more and more farmers are adapting the GPS technology where we're using the variable rate applying the area of the field that is needed. While most of us have heard of Lake Erie's harmful algae blooms, HABs, we don't always understand its meaning past the images of green water splashed in the media with no swimming signs. Not all algae are harmful. They are natural components of marine and freshwater ecosystems and form the foundation of most aquatic food chains. HABs can produce potent toxins. The toxin of greatest concern tends to be microcystin, which causes skin rashes, GI problems, and varying degrees of nervous system, liver, and kidney damage. The negative effects of HABs are felt on land and water alike. For the past few years, the impact of HABs have gained national attention in the wake of the water crisis in Toledo, Ohio, and a growing number of other Ohio cities that have been affected by contaminated drinking water that has become undrinkable due to the extremely high levels of microcystin. These cash-strapped municipalities are forced to take on costly upgrades to water purification systems running into the millions to ensure clean and safe drinking water. It forces fish and tourists alike away to cleaner waters and essentially puts the brakes on sport fishing, boat charters, water recreation, and travel to the Lake Erie region. This has a devastating effect on the restaurants, hotels, travel businesses, and our state and local budgets that rely upon the income that tourism brings to the coffers. The installations of tile drains began in the early 1900s. These are simply drain pipes buried beneath fields to help lower the water table and collect surface water after it has filtered through a few feet of soil and then whisks it away from fields to avoid standing water and surface runoff. This is a major contributor to clay and silt, in addition to nutrient and phosphorus-rich particles ending up in the Lake Erie Basin. Some solutions have already been put in place. 
No-till farming, crop rotation, cover crops, and buffer strips are sometimes used to improve water filtration and soil water storage, which will help to reduce runoff. Farmers are putting fertilizer and manure management practices in place as well. Perhaps the most promising research currently being conducted is through the use of prairie grasses and plants, including specific wildflowers, which are biological sinks. So how do you see the grand design being of incorporating uh, these uh, nutrient uh, attracting, soil retaining uh, prairies in with the modern farm, you know, so that farmer can be productive? Good question. This is brand new. It's never been seen or tried in Ohio. Iowa State has done it. We know that it works. And here's the, here's the answer with a capital A. Let's imagine a farmer has, a producer has a big 500 acre field. And next to that field is a ditch into which all the rainwater runs. At the edge of that ditch, between the ditch and the field, we plant a strip of this tall grass prairie of several grasses and five or ten, the fancy word is forbs, those are wildflowers. Mm -hmm a real for sure diverse mixture of prairie plants. How wide should that strip be? It may be only 20 feet, it may be required to be 40 feet. We don't know until we trial it. But here's the point. Iowa State discovered this. As the rainwater runs across the field and has to filter through all of these prairie grasses here, two things happen. Above ground, these prairie grasses slow the water and cause the silt, the soil, to settle down we dramatically reduce the erosion. Instead of the farmer's topsoil heading into the ditch, it's retained into these prairie edge, field edge strips. But crucially and most importantly, just below ground, all of those microorganisms, the fungi, the bacteria that are found in the root zone of the prairies, they are nutrient magnets they have biochemical means by which they grab onto phosphates, nitrates, potassium, all of these others. Here's the essence of the matter. In Iowa State, they found that a 50-foot strip of prairie grass next to a two to 500-acre row crop field captured 90% of the phosphates that were coming off of that field. If we could have a large percentage of agricultural fields in the Maumee River, the Sandusky River, and the entire western basin of Lake Erie do that, harmful algal blooms will no longer be possible in Lake Erie. It's understood now that if we cut back by about 40%, that will be the threshold. We're cutting back by 90% if we do this. Many ditches, most ditches, not many ditches, let's put it that way, are along the roadsides. Every roadside has a ditch. And presently, uh, they're all mowed to keep weeds out and so forth, to keep brush out. What would happen if we were to plant this, our prairie grasses, in those ditches? Mm -hmm. Yes, they would get six feet tall, but they would have beautiful wildflowers for the honeybees, for the monarch butterflies, and so forth. But again, they would filter out, grab onto, stop, retain mm -hmm. uh, the sediments, the silt, the soil that's moving off and the nutrients that eventually would end up in Lake Erie, but we'll stop them in our ditches. Um, our roadsides aesthetically would look gorgeous. We drive down the road instead of just seeing a V-shaped green ditch, we would see patches of different colored wildflowers, waving grasses, different beautiful colored butterflies uh, during the summertime and the winter. And in the wintertime, we don't mow those grasses down, they stay up. Those grasses become a living snow fence. So the snow is blowing across the field, stop in the ditch, get caught behind the grass, and it would make winter travel a little easier too. So multiple, we, multiple benefits. So we take the smart aspects of these uh, plants, both above the soil, below the soil, and we put a little clever engineering and some good agricultural practices in place, as well as roadside management with our departments of transportation and roadways, and, and we have a more balanced system and probably a lower cost system, do you think? Reduce mowing costs for sure, and of course, the, reduced of the reduction of the cost of harmful algal blooms altogether.
makes sounds like it makes a lot of sense. You know, we know that agriculture is our, our, our largest industry, but not too far back is our tourist industry and our recreation from our, our natural resources right here on Lake Erie and, and throughout the state on our waterways. I mean, this, this is some real solutions. These are real solutions for this, John. When you look at the aspects of uh, Mother Nature and the, and the uniqueness of what biology brings to, to our Mother Earth, it really can tackle a lot of our environmental challenges. Prairie grasses are, are amazing, as I'm getting to know them more. The grasses are intense. They can capture the soils, keep them from eroding, and keep the waters moving down our streams into our Great Lakes clean. In closing, we need to encourage everyone to share the research conducted by John Blakeman and Will Hamker. Bring attention to the simple solution that we can begin to implement now. In addition to the cost savings realized by the farmers and chemical costs, millions more can be saved through reduced lake and river dredging, reduced mowing, and will eliminate the need for costly water purification systems. Our Ohio landscapes can be transformed into a beautiful array of colors, drawing in millions to see the expansive Ohio prairies that keep Ohio's lakes and rivers clean and HAB free, ensuring tourism thrives into the future.